One look around this gruesome place shows that something awful uses it as either a burial crypt or a trophy room. The walls of the vaulted chamber are lined with limed over corpses. A whole circle of barely distinguishable forms creates a lower tier. A fresher ring of calcified corpses seemingly standing upon the heads and shoulders of those beneath decorates the cavern walls at a height of about 12 feet or so. What at first seemed to be a rock formation at the base of the lower ring of petrified bodies is evidently many similar remains. Dwarves, gnomes, halflings, elves, the shorter standing, the taller kneeling or sitting. And this is how we were first introduced to the Bodok in 1982's first edition Advanced Dungeons and Dragons Lost Caverns of Sojacanth Adventure. The Bodok is standing concealed among the chamber's corpses so that the player characters will be caught unaware by a monster no one had ever heard of before. By simply searching the room, they would fall victim to the creature's death gaze. If done correctly, this could have easily resulted in a TPK. And to make matters worse, there was a tribe of troglodytes in the adjacent cavern, which regarded the Bodok as a demigod. The Bodok in this first iteration was described as evil humans changed into monsters by exposure to the demonic forces and substances of the abyss. The Bodok were said to have muscular hairless bodies that are sexless, with dark gray pearly skin. Their heads are long with oddly distorted features. Their eyes are large, milky white ovals. Bodoks speak all demonic languages, but remember few words of human speech. They are very rare in the material plane because they remain on the abyssal planes, except when summoned by a foolish and evil magic user. That's right, we're talking about the Bodok. And as always, I'm your host, Atten, here at We Love TTRPGs. I won't be going into every official adventure which featured these creatures, but I We'll provide those details in the video description. What's important here is the creature itself. The lore and evolution of the monster from an evil transformed human into its current representation is a powerful undead. D&D history and lore. Immediately after the Lost Caverns adventure, the Bodok's next appearance was in 1983's Monster Manual 2, again for first edition Advanced Dungeons and Dragons. This is really the same creature from the Sojacanth adventure, with a new illustration and only slightly updated text telling us a Bodok is a human who was changed into a monster after venturing somewhere upon the abyssal plains where mortals were not meant to be. The evil of the human's nature and the exposure to demonic substances triggered a terrible metamorphosis from man to Bodok. The Bodok then reappeared in second edition AD&D's Monstrous Compendium, Outer Plains Appendix. Here it tells us, a Bodok is created when a mortal dies in the most foul places of the abyss. In this version, the mortal did not have to be evil prior to death. It tells us that dying in particularly foul areas of the abyss results in the transformation. We are also introduced to the concept of a benign Bodok, telling us, for reasons unknown, occasionally a mortal's mind will survive the transition from man to Bodok. When this happens to a non-evil individual, particularly to a good-aligned individual, a benign Bodok is created. This creature has all the powers and abilities of a Bodok, but the mind of the mortal it once was. However, such creatures typically die quickly in the abyss and do not retain spellcasting abilities if it had them prior to their transformation. Where things really begin to get interesting was in the second edition AD&D's Planescape Monstrous Appendix. Here we are introduced to a backstory telling us of a sigil legend called The Bodok Who Walked Home. This story tells us of an evil king named Basilidius, who ruled a small city-state through dark magic. Basilidius captured a fair woman named Helen and sought to make her his queen. Helen's lawful husband, Diomed, the swordsman, went to the palace of the Dark Lord and demanded his wife. Basilidius, who could have killed the swordsman with a mere word or gesture, asked what he would do to win back his bride. Anything, answered Diomed. So Basilidius instructed Diomed to visit the abyss and bring back a handful of soil. Diomed agreed and Basilidius transported them there. Years passed and Helen sickened and died, escaping at last the loveless union forced on her. One day, a cowled man, evidently a rich merchant, came to Basilidius' castle. He claimed to have a present for the hated lord. The stranger was shown into Basilidius' audience chamber. I have brought you this, said the visitor. He poured soil from a black silk bag onto the floor. The soil became blood, and the blood became snakes. 
Basilidius knew this was soil from the abyss, but before he could act, the visitor removed his cowl. The sight of the Bodak killed all within, and Diomed the Bodak walked outside the castle to tell the people their dread lord was dead. The sun scorched his impure flesh, but just before the rotting mass fell, Diomed is said to have smiled. The next major entry for the Bodak comes from 2nd edition AD&D's Bases of Evil, The Fiends. It informs us the word Bodak in the abyssal tongue means unfinished dead. It also says that Bodak can be of either gender, since they originate from mortals of either sex, but hate their existence so much they have no desire to procreate. They rest only briefly to heal from prior battles and most likely gain nourishment from the life force they consume with their deadly gaze. In every edition thus far, we were told they could speak, but not many details were provided. Here, though, we are informed that a Bodok rarely speaks except to growl a curse at their target. However, in the case of a benign Bodok, it will usually do whatever it can to help mortals lost in the abyss. Even then, it will still only speak in nearly incomprehensible grunts and growls. It also says a Bodok caught in direct sunlight slowly withers and dies for good. According to the Monster Manual from Dungeons & Dragons 3rd Edition, the Bodok are the undead remnants of humanoids who were destroyed by the touch of absolute evil. In 3rd Edition's Hordes of the Abyss, I only found four references to the Bodok. One was in regard to the demon lord Grazit, allowing them to wander the mirrored halls of his Argent Palace. And then on the 73rd layer of the Abyss, which is patrolled by 15-foot-tall Bodak giants with 27 hit dice. In Dragon Magazine number 307 from May of 2003, some really twisted individual came up with Bodok templates. So you could create five-headed Bodak Hydras, for example. The overall description of the Bodok's appearance and abilities are essentially the same as past versions, with the exception of offering a template to turn nearly any creature into a Bodok. The article says the Bodok can speak the languages it knew in life. In that game called 4th Edition Dungeons & Dragons, we are told the Bodok is a heartless creature that kills for the sake of killing, either serving their own desire or that of an even crueler master. It also says that Bodok are undead humanoids with strong ties to the Shadowfell, with an appearance so ghastly they can kill with a look. And because that game just wasn't happy if it didn't completely rewrite and retcon existing long-standing and established lore, it tells us the Bodok is created when a Nightwalker slays a humanoid and performs a ritual transformation. Such Bodok are then servants of the Nightwalker that does whatever its master dictates. In Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition Bolo's Guide to Monsters, a Bodok is described as the undead remains of someone who revered Orcus. Devoid of life and soul, it exists only to cause death. It then tells us a worshipper of Orcus can take ritual vows while carving the demon lord's symbol on its chest over the heart. Orcus's power flays body, mind, and soul, leaving behind a sentient husk that sucks in all life energy near it. Most Bodok come into being in this way, then unleashed to spread death in Orcus's name. Orcus created the first Bodoks in the Abyss from seven devotees called the Hierophants of Annihilation. These figures, as mighty as Balors, have free will but serve the Prince of Undeath directly. Any one of these Bodak can turn a slain mortal into a Bodok with its gaze. Like each Hierophant of Annihilation, every Bodok bears the mark of Orcus as a chest wound, an opening where a mortal humanoid's heart would be. Orcus can recall anything a Bodok sees or hears. If he so chooses, he can speak through a Bodok to address his enemies and followers directly. Bodok are extensions of Orcus's will outside the abyss, serving the demon prince's aims. And even nature despises Bodoks. The sun burns away a Bodok's tainted flesh. The creature's gaze lays waste to the living. Anyone a Bodok slays with its gaze withers its face frozen in a mask of terror. The monster's mere presence is so unnatural that it chills the soul. Animals untrained for war instinctively flee just before a Bodok arrives. In 5th edition's Morning Caden Presents Monsters of the Multiverse, the Bodok is described in much the same way as from Bolo's Guide, with little to no changes. From here, we learn that a Bodok retains vague impressions of its past life. It seeks out its former allies and enemies alike to destroy them as its warped soul seeks to erase anything connected to its former life. Minions of Orcus are the one exception to this compulsion. A Bodok recognizes them as kindred souls and spares them from its wrath. Anyone who knew the individual before its transformation 
into a bodak can recognize mannerisms or other subtle clues to its original identity. In Keith Amon's The Monsters Know What They're Doing, he sums up a bodak really well, stating, a bodak's approach to combat is basically, come at me, bro. Attacking a bodak is like fighting a fire. You have to not only douse the flames, but do so before you get burned to death yourself. Any and every foe that comes to dispatch it has to run the gauntlet of its withering gaze, death gaze, and aura of annihilation. I'll provide a link to his full article in this video's description. And now let's explore some Game Master tips. Throughout the different versions of the Bodok, there are a few interesting themes that you might wish to use in your campaigns. The first is that a Bodok may be summoned by a powerful magic user, but each time a Bodok is given a command, it might gain control over its summoner. In first edition AD&D, it says every time a Bodok is assigned a new task by its master, it has a chance to control the magic user who summoned it. The intelligence of the Bodok is randomly determined by rolling a d20 each time it is given a new task. If the Bodok's intelligence is higher than the magic user's, the Bodok controls the mind of the magic user and can enslave him or her. And then what happens when a Bodok is now running loose in the city? how many of its victims are rising again as new Bodok, and can the players kill them all fast enough before the whole area is overrun? Sure, the 5th edition version is not even close to being as deadly as earlier versions, but super easy, barely an inconvenient. What about dozens of them? Another interesting ability some Bodok may possess are residual memories of its former life. At the start of every encounter, the DM should allow for a 5% chance that the Bodok recognizes something familiar about an opponent. If this happens, the Bodok takes no action against that opponent for one round, and thereafter suffers a negative two morale penalty to attack that target. In fifth edition, this could simply give disadvantage against that target, or choose to have the Bodok cower or flee from that person. The Dragon Magazine article in issue number 307 gives a nice short list of suggestions for this. They include things like recognizing a cleric's holy symbol, or perhaps confusing the target for a former lover. In the book Open Grave, for the game called 4th Edition Dungeons and Dragons, we learn that when a Bodok's gaze fails to slay a creature, the victim instead witnesses an unsettling vision of his or her own death. In this case, their vision frightened the NPC so much they've turned over a new leaf. They're giving away all their wealth and helping charity. They've literally changed alignment. This could result in an interesting moral dilemma. Do they turn away a good NPC simply because they had a terrible past? And if so, wouldn't they be causing harm since the NPC wouldn't be able to right the wrongs he had committed in the past? Originally, the Bodok were not undead, just evil monsters transformed by exposure to the Abyss. As if the Abyss is so evil and volatile, it could be absorbed into a living being causing the horrible mutations resulting in a Bodok. Although the Bodok is now presented as undead, it doesn't completely conflict with Gary Gygax's version, as they were very rare and not much was known about them. Perhaps scholars simply hadn't fully understood them yet. And in first edition AD&D's descriptions, we were told that they could only be harmed by magical or cold wrought iron weapons, and they were immune to poison, charm, sleep, and hold spells. Additionally, they took half damage from cold, electricity, and fire, and they were harmed by direct sunlight. So really, without categorizing them as undead, they had a lot of the same strengths and weaknesses as undead type creatures. I still remember the first time I DM'd Lost Caverns of Sojacanth and my players fighting their first Bodok. These monsters have been among my favorite party killers ever since. In 5th edition D&D, with their aura of annihilation and death gaze, these challenge rating 6 creatures should not be underestimated. They have dark vision out to 120 feet and a passive perception of 14 with bonuses to perception and stealth. So these creatures are likely to ambush their targets, just as presented in their very first appearance in 1982. They're resistant to cold, fire, and necrotic damage. They are also resistant to non-magical bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing weapons. They're immune to lightning and poison, as well as the charmed, frightened, and poisoned conditions. Well, I hope this information will inspire you to murder your players in a new and creative way. If you've had some experiences with these monsters as a player or game master, I'd love to hear about it in the comments. As always, I'm your host Atten, here at We Love TTRPGs, and I appreciate your support by liking the video, and if this is your first time here, be sure to subscribe and turn on notifications so you don't miss any of our future uploads. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you soon 
with many more useful videos for your role-playing games.